Thank you very much, UPCSR, for having me here. So my talk is on syncopy and normal ECG. So we all know that syncopy is, it's not running, not seen, I think slides are not there. So syncope is very short transient loss of consciousness with very quick recovery. So my talk is on normal ECG diagnostic pathway. So if you say syncope, that means it's a cardiac syncope. And if it's a cardiac syncope, if I'm talking about normal ECG, it ranges from vasovagal syncope to structural heart disease. I'll be talking about cases in whom the ECG, baseline ECG is normal. So if I talk about baseline ECG is normal, I think my one take home point will be, take very good clinical history, see for demographics, that is very important, and see the clinical situation when the syncope has happened, and what age it has happened, and do, do some dynamic uh, uh, changes are happening in the ECG, we should search for that. And if you look about the cases, about the channelopathy, apart from structural heart disease, commonest is long QT syndrome, followed by Brugada, CPVT, then you have some structural heart disease cases. So as I've already emphasized, that the clinical history is most important. Past medical history, family screening is very important, physical examination for, for subtle changes in the hands, legs, to see for if the patient is having some channelopathies. Then echocardiography, ARVC, why I've put a question mark? Because sometimes it's a little difficult to diagnose an, on echocardiography if there's an RV out pouching or some dyskinesia is there. Never forget to do extended ECG monitoring if baseline ECG is normal, followed by stress tests and the provocative tests. I would like to show uh, my thing with the case examples. This is a 10-year-old boy with rec recurrent syncope, structurally normal heart. So if you see this child, apart from sinus arrhythmia, there is nothing in the ECG. But when I took a detailed history of the child, her brother is okay, but on the father's side, one of the sister's son died at the age of 12 years. So this is raising an alarm. Doing a TMT is little difficult in children. So what I did, I, extend, I put him on extended monitoring, and I did real-time monitoring. In front of my device clinic, I made him run. First 10 minutes, nothing happened. 12 minutes, nothing happened. 15 minutes, nothing happened. 17th minute, I started seeing these PVCs. As soon as I started seeing these PVCs, I made him lie down. And when he started taking rest, even after taking rest, now you can see single morphology PVC has changed into multiple morphology, different cycle length, changing coupling interval, which is really high risk. And I think now everyone can make the diet. It kept on going for some time. So you should know when to stop when you are doing a provocative test, even with adrenaline challenge test. We don't have flikinite, we don't have, we don't have procanamide, all those edgemelin to, de to do the challenge test. But we should know when to stop. So I stopped there. After some time, the child settled. And this is the genetic analysis of the child. He's on beta blocker, doing very good. This is a second guy, 33-year male, recurrent syncope, structurally normal heart. Baseline ECG is absol absolutely normal. This was a very interesting patient. This patient came to me with the, with the advice of pacemaker. Someone advised pacemaker, so he, he came for second opinion. If you walk through this, there is no change in the PR interval, and suddenly there is one P which is dropped. So everyone will think about it's a high-grade AV block. But if you walk through this, before the P wave, AV nodal block, P, 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 P is slowing down. So what is this? So whenever P, P, P slows down, before the AV nodal block, this is vaguely mediated AV block, which doesn't need a device. Why a young guy will develop vagal mediated AV block? When I started asking detailed history, this guy during the COVID time was staying alone, IT professor, IT uh, worker, staying at home alone, no work, he started going to gym. Without exaggeration, he says that sometimes I do gym, gymming for 10 hours in one day. And with his permission, I took this picture. He, he gave these pictures to me. He's putting 250 kg weight on him, and he's doing daily 10 hours exercise, which he trained himself over just one year. So this patient I saw in June 2020, and now it's been almost one and a half years. He stopped all these exercises, doing good, no pacemaker, nothing, no AV nodal AV block. This is a third patient, 21 year old male, one episode of blackout. This guy is working in some hospital. He had some uneasiness, giddiness in the hospital. And because there is some early repole changes, if you can see V4, V5, lead one, lead AVL, he was diagnosed with ACS. I think this is the commonest diagnosis we cardiologists are making in the hospital. Not only ACS, this 21-year guy, he underwent endo angiography, normal coronaries. Despite of that, if you can see, direct LDL is 10, triglyceride is 50. He was an 80 milligram of atorvastatin, dual antiplatelet. When I asked history, he said, my mother died at 25 years of age suddenly. 
So this was online appointment for me. I said, okay, you get an extended monitoring done and I'll do real time monitoring. I started real time monitoring. And what is astonishing here? Can you see this? This is a dynamic P wave changes, which is really interesting to me. Can you see this? Why this same, almost same heart rate, but the P wave without change in depolarization, if there's a changes in the repolarization is a marker of sudden cardiac death. This I've highlighted this. If you can see this P wave upright, almost same rate, almost same time, there's a dynamic T wave changes. This was very interesting for me. So I spoke to the guys because I'm developing this device with them. I said, I want the position change at this time. If you see the, these are the three X, Y, Z axis to show that there is no change in the position. Without change in the position, without change in the rate, there is a dynamic T wave abnormality. And I asked them to do a QTC calculation. We all are aware we should be very precautious when you're doing Q automatic QT cal calculation. But I sat with them. I've done manual QTC calculation. If you can see, one is 490 at 110. At 132, it is 490. So at a faster heart rate, QTC should come down. It should not go up. This is by Bazit's formula. And to my luck, I called him. I said, can you get your 12 lead ECG done at that time? He got this done. And you can see it's more than 600. Any QTC of more than 500 is a diagnostic of long QT interval. So he's, he's, I've sent his analysis. He's on beta blocker doing good now. 17-year-old boy, boy diagnosed with status epilepticus. He was on phenidone infusion when he came. He was on ventilator. He was con continuously on anti-epileptic medication, but this time someone in emergency in some hospital, they saw that having a polymorphic VT, normal QT interval, so sent to a cardiologist. Came to me, we, I saw him in the emergency. And when I saw, I did some changes in the ECG. ECG is looking okay, but I did some changes. So what I did, because I was suspecting something, he had fever, I had kept chest leads in the parasternal region, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6, and I think there is a type 1 Brugada pattern. Ones who are not able to recognize, I've just done a measurement here. There's no doubt about it. Managed with isoprenaline infusion, stopped phenytoin, did well. He was really doing well. So here is the importance of meticulous follow-up this patient. I've just recently published this patient because he turned out to be cardiac sarcoidosis, not, not Brugada syndrome. Brugada gene was negative. This is my last, last slide. So this guy had each and everything of Brugada syndrome. Starting from, I'll show you, he had polymorphic VT, he had VF, he had short couple PVCs, he had monomorphic VT, he had AFib as well. On follow-up, this normal ECG over three months of follow-up became QRBB. And if you see down in this child, why I did this? Because it was unusual. Unusual is the sense that he was not responding to any medication. Whole night I was sitting on the bedside of this patient giving shocks to him. So anyways, this, this case is available. This is, scar is there in the MRI. There was a lot of uptake on the pet, started on medication doing good, but now he has all fractionated QRA. So he's not Brugada syndrome, he's a Brugada mimicker, and he's a cardiac sarcoidosis. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sagu. Uh, please have a seat. We'll come back to you for the discussions. Ladies and gentlemen, the penultimate uh, presentation of this session features approach to a patient.